You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have this individual has been requested ever since I started this show. <laughs> and I have been I've been almost working up the ranks of Maryland's uh, Department of Wildlife Resources to, uh, to get to him. Joe. Uh, you're a legend. You've been a, you've been know. around forever. <laughs> I with don't this know stuff. about that, <laughs> but I have been doing this job for a little while now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I enjoy it. Um, it's it's a privilege actually to work for the department and to work for one of the most popular fisheries, if not the most popular fishery and uh, sport fish uh, in the state. So and it's it's because like when I created uh, DM the fishing DMV, which is really DC, Maryland, Virginia. The main water that I think gets national attention in our area, it, it is, it's the tidal Potomac. It's the one that Bass Masters, the FLW, now MLF, that's where everyone yep. goes to. Yep. Um, and the fact is that you have to run this fishery that gets so much spotlight, so much yeah. national attention all the time. And I can't imagine, like, like I, I guess before we get carried away, guys, like, how did all this start for you? Well, so um, actually, I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a, a, you know, an avid bass angler. I know that, you know, some people that you've spoken to and, and others who get into this field, they're, you know, going fishing for bass and they absolutely love it. And uh, that, that's kind of what, mm -hmm. you know, gets them into bass management. For me, it was a little different. Um, my background more is in more uh, conservation and ecology of fishes. I am just absolutely fascinated by fish. I've always loved fish since I was very young. I would start learning scientific names oh, cool. of sharks, right? I had a little had a little notebook where I'd write them down and write down all these little life history traits. I was doing that like at age 10. Shark and week. I, uh -huh. That gets you hooked on it, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> when I was 10, I don't think we had shark week. Uh, so that was a little before that time. But the, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I, I did read a lot and I went to the library. And, um, you know, I, I guess ever since then, I was just fascinated with the fact that we've got this tremendous diversity of animals that live in the water that we don't see every day, we don't interact with. It's not like birds, right? So unless you're, you know, <laughs> Aquaman, able to <laughs> swim underwater for mm -hmm. long periods of time, so you, know, you don't really get to, to experience that biodiversity. So I guess that kind of mystery is what captured me uh, at an early age. And then... Um, and then when I started going to school, I started learning more about the conservation um, and the value of that and, you know, fish diversity. And so I uh, worked with freshwater systems, marine systems, estuarine systems. And so, um, you know, I was on the trajectory to teach mm -hmm. at the university for a while. And uh, what that's, university was this again? I must have. Uh, university of Maryland Eastern Shore okay. is where I was. And I was... Um, I was on the trajectory to teach, um, oh, cool. but I, yeah, I was actually really enjoying it. We did a lot of work in the uh, the Atlantic. I worked with NOAA, right? Um, and we did a lot of work on the coastal lagoons and I had a lot of good folks, students. Um, it was a lot of good, a lot of good times. But uh, at some point I thought, well, maybe I can make a difference in resource management because I do care about conservation. And so when this position opened up, uh, for largemouth bass, I thought, well, this this might be my opportunity to to get into the state because it's not easy sometimes to get these jobs. That's a big decision, though. It was a big decision. Um, it was either Maryland DNR or South Carolina DNR. I had two job offers at the time, wow. and I was yeah, one for marine systems and one for bass. And I was thinking, well, which which do I want? It was really a hard decision actually for me to make. But uh, I decided to stay here in Maryland and uh, work with largemouth bass. And I was excited from the conservation aspect. You know, this is a top freshwater predator, and in in an ecosystem, it's it's a very valuable asset, right? Mm -hmm. We need these freshwater predators, just like we need sharks in marine ecosystems. Yes, yes. And and so from the conservation side, I was like, well, this this makes a lot of sense to me. But then I started when I took this position, I started learning more about stakeholder views and how valuable it is in management. And not just in Maryland, but nationwide. And so that added a whole other level of complexity uh, for me. And it was a, a pretty quick education, actually, because the first year I started in 2009, uh, we had a bass tournament on uh, Mattawoman Creek, which is a major stream of the Potomac River. And um, they, they held a tournament over a course of a weekend, and we ended up with 
five or 600 dead bass floating on the river. And that was the first year I started. So I was dealing with the press, I was dealing with people, and we were trying Good luck. to- <laughs> <laughs> well, look, and and there was a time, and maybe we're still in it, though I've though I've I think things have changed a bit since when I started. But there was a time when people really didn't like tournaments; they hated tournaments. They didn't want them around. Uh, they blamed them for dead fish. They blamed them for you know a poor fishing day, and there was a lot of that um, happening, particularly when five hundred dead fish are mm -hmm. floating in the in the water, and that was a problem uh, for me. Um, as well as for the fish. And I was trying to figure out how to deal with it from a management point of view. So that was a quick education uh, into working with the press, working with other stakeholders and trying to, you know, we, you know, we didn't want to, you know, ban tournament fishing, right? Um, but we needed to manage it appropriately. And so from there, you know, yeah, that, that took an interesting turn. Um, so it didn't just become about conservation for me. You know, and I really started understanding th what management means um, from both an academic scientific perspective as well as from a sociological perspective. And that that's what I've been doing since 2009. So now I apply it to other fisheries, like snakeheads and blue catfish tend to be a little bit more controversial now than bass, but even largemouth bass still has you know, major issues in some places. And um, so it, it definitely keeps me keeps me busy. Yeah. And that's something interesting that I want to get into about the stakeholders because John Odenkirk has mentioned this and it's something yep. that you don't think about until you, I started this, this media network and you get to talk to both sides. You get to talk to, to the regular civilians, the fishermen, the outdoorsmen, and then you get to talk to people that actually are in the trenches with it. And you say stakeholders. And I think a lot of times the people on the ground is like, well, just do this for me. Yeah. It's about me. And you don't understand this broader picture of it's not just the anglers that enjoy this body of water. Um, yeah. I mean, just talk to that more like, what do you mean by stakeholders just for the people that maybe don't understand what that means that are listening to this program? And if you can move the mic just a little bit closer. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you know, I guess in a very simple sense, a stakeholder is really any person who has a a stake in the resource of so, you know they they see the resource in this case largemouth bass mm -hmm. um as valuable to them and that could include someone like me um who is uh, interested in conservation of ecosystems and protecting our top freshwater predator uh, out there um it could also include people who like fishing for it and we have a lot of different people who fish. Uh, we have recreational folks who are just pastime fishing. They're going out, they're taking their kids, they're going out and just enjoying their life. Um, we also have competitive sport uh, anglers, tournament fishermen. Um, they're going out and potentially competing for money or you know maybe beer of <laughs> a small club, something like that, a fifth of whiskey, whatever. Um, we also have people who build businesses uh, around bass, right? So we have groups like Bass Pro Shops, and they sell a lot of tackle aimed at, mm -hmm. at bass. So they're definitely a stakeholder. We have charter boat guides. They get paid money to take clients out to go fishing. Uh, we had a very uh, popular uh, charter boat guide, uh, Captain Ken Penrod, and he was famous for taking out George Bush. You know, so we have people on the on the river. Uh, Penrod, there he's from um, the Potomac River, but we have charter boat guides across the state. So we have um, people who build businesses on the backs of bass, uh, and they're all stakeholders. And then you know you may argue, we may argue that you know every one of us who maybe live in this state could be a potential stakeholder in 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 bass. Some people care more than others, right? But we all have a stake in making sure our aquatic ecosystems are healthy and bass are a way of doing that, making mm -hmm. sure that we have healthy stocks, healthy populations of bass. It's a way of making sure our aquatic ecosystems are healthy. And so we all tend to have a stake in it. It's just that some people have more of a stake if they have a business or if that's the species they're targeting. Uh, if, if a lot of folks invest a lot of money into bass fishing. You may have seen their boats. Once They're not twice. cheap. Yeah, <laughs> I have been twice. We have a really bad, old, ugly bass boat. Uh, it has been around with us for a while. I've taken it out a couple times. I don't know how I've made it back in that boat. <laughs> it's trailered right now. Um, but those boats, you know, they get 
up to like 80, 90, 100,000, you know, sometimes they get wrapped, you know, and, they, and a lot of people spend a lot of money, not just on the boats, but on the tackle and on the gear and the fishing rods. So people will invest a lot of money into this fishery and they tend to prioritize it. So they are, you know, very important stakeholders. When you look at a tidal estuary like the Potomac or Upper Bay or Eastern Shore places like that, compared to a deep creek, or I think about it as a Lake Anna, where you have a huge, you have a big stakeholder in the homeowners association and mm -hmm. people that own property and recreation use that. Does that differ at all when you then talk about like the tidal Potomac mm -hmm. or or Back Bay or or, or like or um, the Upper Potomac or yeah, sorry the Upper Bay places like that where do you still have that same pull of homeowners associations people that recreationally use jet skis and things of that ilk or is that more of a lake thing? I think you know there there are stakeholder conflicts in whichever fishery whichever area you visit. Um, yes, in, in places like Deep Creek Lake where you, where you have a lot of tourism and the tourism there sometimes is not generated by the bass fishery, you no, know, they no. come down, right? They come down to- I would argue that probably is way more comparatively, like just how much is generated just by the lake itself and tourism. Yeah, so anytime you have people who have different value sets, mm -hmm. um, you end up with conflict. And I think that hap well, I know yes, that happens on the Potomac. <laughs> I mean, I was- you know, I, I, I work with uh, commercial harvesters as well oh, yeah, for various fine. things, right? And there's definitely a conflict between commercial harvesters on, on the Potomac, for example, and bass anglers in general, whether they're fishing tournaments or they're f recreationally fishing mm -hmm. or they're charter boat guides. And I mean, I understand a lot of where that, that conflict comes from. But, you know, I've talked to harvesters who have had their nets cut, right? Um I mean, they say by bass anglers, I don't know because I'm not out there, but um, I know that there are shouting matches uh, and those are all conflicts. You know, they mm. have different priorities, right? They're both doing different things and that leads to conflict. In terms of, you know, homeowners, I don't, on, in tidal waters, I don't see as much conflict between homeowners and bass anglers as I do say homeowners and bow fishers right now. Interesting. Yeah. But um, that's not to say there there aren't those conflicts. And and I mention that because in some places where we have uh, weigh-ins uh, for tournaments like Anchor Marine in the Upper Bay, um, sometimes there could be dead fish that float up. There's delayed mortality after fish are released. Uh, sometimes those fish float up and they decompose, and that creates um, less of an, an enjoyable experience. It's not as aesthetically pleasing. It's to not the aesthetically homeowner. pleasing yeah. to homeowners, right? Uh, so you know there there can be those conflicts. They're not as massive as I've seen, um, say with with the bow fishing community, but um, they I'm not going to say that they don't occur. But there's definitely conflict. It just uh, you know depending on where you are, it's not just in lakes. We also see it in rivers. Is bow fishing? I, I'm I could be off by this, but did it really mm -hmm. explode in popularity when the snakehead really got entrenched in our areas? Uh -huh. Or am I just paying more attention to it now than I used to? Well, it may be both. Um, I kn you know, I was just speaking with a, a bow fisher last night and a charter boat Compton, and um, I asked him that actually very question, and he, you know, he said what I expect him to say, and that is when snakehead became more prolific and more established, saw more bow fishers out there. You know, prior to that, there's definitely bow fishing. You know, we had people out there who were bow fishing carp. We had people bow fishing um, gar and and gizzard shad, maybe uh, goldfish. But uh, when snakeheads came on the circuit, you know, that's an edible fish mm -hmm. and an easily edible fish, right? You could eat a gar; it's just a little, <laughs> a little bit more challenging to get into it. Um, you know, so. We ended up seeing more people get into that fishery. Not only can they have a target, but they also have, you know, an edible fish, something that can they can do, uh, something they can do with it. And um, then we have blue catfish, yep. which are also a target for bow fishers. And so um, we're definitely seeing more people going after blue catfish with with a bow, which is actually a surprise to me. Actually, last year was the first year that you know I, up to that point of last year, I had thought well. Bowfishers are really going after snakeheads and some of these others, like the, the gar and stuff. 
But uh, last year, I learned after talking to Charlie, no, 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 they're, it's a very effective way of going after blue cats as well. And I saw the pitches. And I'm like, oh, hmm. wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're definitely learning more about it. Last night when we were on the water, I saw, you know, we, we, had, we were in the upper bay on the flats and they had about four or five other boats out there that were bow fishing. Wow. And our guide pointed to them and said, yeah, those are all going after blue cats because this is the time of year for blue cat fishing with but we were going after snakeheads because of our project but um they were going after blue cats and i thought well this you know that's incredible so that's another target and and, and as the both the blue catfish population and the snakehead population have expanded their range and increased in biomass yes we have seen more people investing money into boat fishing at night and that's also led to some conflict on the water. And I can see, I guess, with the lights, if you're a homeowner, that would be quite uh, disturbing at 2 a.m. on a Friday to have uh -huh. that out there. Yeah. The other thing I, I, I could potentially see, I guess, would be like, are they disturbing the SAV beds by idling through there compared to a trolling motor? But then it's like, well, what's worse, a trolling motor on a bass boat or, you know, a right. Yamaha? You right. Know, like well, the good news is with a lot of our freshwater grass beds, um, you know, they, they do tend to grow quickly um and we have had you know loss of grass just naturally but then it resurges relatively quickly the scars that you, the prop scars you're talking mm -hmm. about um heal pretty quickly because of the types of species we have in our freshwater ecosystems plus you're you're right i mean you know trolling motor what's you know, the yeah. what's the, what's the difference right so um the main concern that we've heard re regarding conflict, I know this is kind of off topic from Bass. No, but, no, no, go for it. Yeah. Good conversation. Uh, the main concern that we've heard re revolving around, you know, homeowners and bow fishers is the light pollution yeah. and also noise pollution. Um, you know, so it's, it's odd, you know, it's, it's a little scary if you're a homeowner, um, and you see these lights on the water, you buy a property, you don't see lights on the water for years. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's true. It's, you, it's yeah, you mm -hmm. look outside yeah. and suddenly you see three or four boats. We saw this on on the Potomac. So, of course, snakehead became pretty abundant on the Potomac first, uh, as did blue cats. But um, bow fishers were going after snakeheads before they were going after blue cats on the Potomac. And as that fishery began developing on the Potomac, uh, we ended up seeing some of these conflicts owed to light pollution. Stuff. But I think at what, what we saw is that people became more accustomed to the bow fishers. And so that conflict kind of lessened. But now we have range expansion of snakeheads, range expansion of blue cats, plus blue cats are becoming more of a target for bow fishers. So um, we have range expansion into new areas like the Upper Bay Gunpowder River, where people are less accustomed to seeing these bow fishers, and so that's all that's leading to kind of the same types of conflicts we saw on the Potomac. I think that people will get used to seeing bow fishers in their backyard. Um, I I hope that you know everyone can be a little bit understanding on both sides because. You know, we don't want noise pollution. We don't want lights being shined on our windows, right? I understand all that. Um, I also understand from homeowners that they're thankful that there are bow fishers out there in some cases going after snakeheads because they're invasive species, right? And it's protecting the, the ecosystem. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely common ground there. Um, I think if we all play in the sandbox nice together, though. Um, that's the dream. Isn't that's it? the dream, right? <laughs> Uh, I think I think it'll work, but there are some growing pains, and we're early in the fishery, and I keep reminding people of that. I think they know that um, in the upper bay, you know, snakeheads maybe have become more abundant in the past three or four years, blue cats as well. So we are still th those areas are still very young fisheries, and I think people are just you know, becoming more accustomed to that. So if you're a homeowner, you're starting to see this, you might have questions about it, you might have complaints about it, and that's good. You can voice those complaints and kind of resolve those conflicts. Um, I, I, you know, I do ask that, you know, particularly if you're a bow fisher, to be mindful that, you know, lights being shined in people's windows is not 
great for establishing a good relationship and hooping and hollering at two in the morning is not mm. great for your children who may be sleeping. So, you know, do unto others as they might do etiquette, unto you, yeah. right? Yeah. On water and, etiquette. and be a little bit more thoughtful. And it, look, happens, I'm sure we have the same problems, some of the same problems during the day <laughs> as we do at night. It's just that we're sleeping at night. Um, and we tend to be a little bit more thoughtful during the day uh, sometimes. But, you know, we have to be thoughtful at night now. So. It, it's just so interesting how this new market came about because of the invasives. And I actually, about two weeks ago, I had a conversation with um, a Martin Gary of uh, the Potomac River Association. PRFC? It, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And it was just going through the data and the analytics on just going from, you know, ground zero at the James and how they spread and how they handle salinity. And it's yep. just, it's a hell of a fight you guys have on your hands. Like, I don't know. I, I want to be optimistic, but damn, like that is... <laughs> Whew. Yeah, you know, blue cats, um, it's a, yeah. the, the, you know, the sad thing about these invasives, you know, we, we didn't ask for it. We mm -hmm. didn't ask for this problem. Um, and it's just, some people, you know, particularly with snakeheads, there's so much controversy about that, or a little bit of controversy. There. Some people don't regard them as problems. Some people do. Um, at the end of the day, it's an issue that we need to address. And blue cats is, you know, blue catfish, you know, generally definitely an issue that we need to address um how we address it is 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 actually becoming more of a issue right because early on we're like oh, please harvest them get 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 rid of them take them home but you know there's a threshold and there's a fatigue by by anglers there's only so much that people can do and mm -hmm. and take um and particularly with blue catfish, which get really abundant and, and really prevalent everywhere, if we don't begin developing commercial markets, right, we're going to saturate what our recreational anglers can do, what our recreational harvesters will do. A lot of people, there's, there's so many people who go to the markets and buy tilapia, right? So now we have to convince them, instead of buying tilapia from, you know, Wegmans or wherever, mm. Safeway, you know, why don't you fillet this blue catfish that you just caught in the water, right? And it's not an easy sell. Not everyone is a harvester. Everyone who's fishing, they're not harvesting. A lot of folks don't. A lot of folks practice catch and release. And so now we're asking them, when you catch a blue catfish, can you harvest it? It's, you know, it's it's the ideal. Yeah, but it, it's, it's hard because it's culture. And yes. so, I mean, I bring yep. it back to like sharks. Like what happened after the movie Jaws and how long did it take, take to change and continue to change people's cultural a view of sharks? Yep. And then you look at catch and release. Like how long was it that you didn't ever do catch and release? release a catch and release tournament you kidding me right right and now it's almost you're wanting to like deprogram it's like no, no no hold on hold on with a little caveat here is this now and it's just yep. it takes so long to win that culture battle with people it absolutely absolutely does part of it is you know maybe how you were raised the region you grew up in that's true um yeah look and we, and we still deal with i mean for for years i've been dealing with people asking about the water quality in in the bay and and whether they can eat fish out of it and whether they can eat oysters out of it you know um virginia's had some issues right as mm -hmm. i remember it with oysters so um i think dc has turned off their striped bass fishing not allowed to eat striped bass out of dc waters if i recall correctly so you know there are there are issues people talk about the anacostia <laughs> quite yeah. a bit right um i i think i think uh you know there's there's this disconnect that's kind of developed here in the bay that you know i'm from louisiana so we don't hmm. we eat fish and crawfish and stuff from the what i grew up doing that but here i don't know i mean it just seems like there's a bit more it's of it so transient and yeah you, it's it's becoming such a metropolis when you think about louisiana or the carolinas where you know fishing and outdoors is, is in your blood generationally yeah and you know somebody that goes hunting and yep. now you look at the way like i grew up in vienna guys and what vienna is now compared to like 30 years ago it's completely different it's insane how much it grew and it's people coming in here because of the jobs and, and the economy and so you get these people in here that probably don't have that that background that culture in stewardship of the outdoors and that makes your fight that much harder you know it's about education it's about outreach it's about marketing and campaigning um spreading the word because sometimes if you are transient and you're not getting that information say from the people you grew up with right you ought to get it from somewhere mm -hmm. 
And you might get it from your friends, you may get it from the news, you may get it from Facebook, but we know that information can be, misinformation can be spread pretty quickly, often more quickly than good information. So um, that just makes our job, it in some way reprioritizes what we do as a fishery management agency, right? I think back when I started this, I had thought, well, it's really all, you know, fishery statistics, we monitor indices, and we talk with people about where to go fishing, right? Um, now I think it's become a little bit more, I think it's become a little different, right? Where we're reprioritizing more public outreach on some of this information, right? On ethics, on, on being a That's, good angler, yeah. or, um, you know, w what to do when you get an invasive species, or how you treat a largemouth bass when you want to release it and keep it alive, you know? Those types of messages are not easy to develop because oftentimes it requires an industry, not just a single person, right? So you have to collaboratively develop mm -hmm. the message and then you have to push the message out. And there's a lot of traffic and noise out there, right? A lot of podcast shows. There are a lot of face Facebook posts, Instagram right now. We have Thread and all this kind of stuff goes out there. So it's just, um, it can be dizzying to try and get your message out. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. No, Marketers yeah. have been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. Um, it's so, consistency. It's hitting that drum every day and you yes. keep doing it. And that's and that requires a little bit of work. Oh, and yeah. when you're reprioritizing um, to do that work, that means you potentially need new staff. You need to kind of reframe the mindset. And, you know, state government sometimes can be challenging to reframe the mindset really quickly, right? Because some things become entrenched and um, there's institutional infrastructure that remains fairly steady. And so it it can be a challenge to kind of reprioritize things. But I think, uh, I think we're heading in a better direction now um, to hit some of these, um, as you as you call it, transitional, tra transient kind of community development, but um, that 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 is the challenge, you know, to kind of reach these people with new information, knowing that they may not be getting it elsewhere. And that makes it that makes and again, this is like pulling back the veil and looking at what your job is, and it's not like like just fix this problem because I saw it in the back of Mad Woman. Right. It's it's way more complicated, and that also brings about like the Black Bass um, Conservation Group. Like, how did all that get started, and where? Is that something that's that's underneath you? Is that a separate entity? How does that get into the mix? Yeah. So, you know, we when I started, when I started, you know, I, I knew because of the value of the black bass fishery within the state and how many people targeted black bass. I mean, it's the number one sport fish in the state, and it's been that way for decades. Um, it's probably, arguably, the number one sport fish in the country, oh, yeah. and so we get we get people from from Canada, from overseas, from all the states, Arkansas, coming to Maryland, mm -hmm. coming to the Bay to go fishing for bass, knowing that, knowing that there are a lot of differences in opinion, lots of different viewpoints based upon where these people grew up and, and how they handle fish, I knew that we need to have public input on how we manage this fishery as an agency, right? So we can... We had in, in 2009 uh, Black Bass Roundtable, which included the general, okay. yep, which included the general public and uh, some members of the general public, particularly the stakeholders who were um, heavily invested in the fishery, right? So some charter boat guides, bass tournament folks, and we would talk about some of these issues. Now, every year we talk about issues that concern them. And it was just a very loose group of folks. But then we ended up with a problem on the Potomac River where the fishery for bass um, Was that the fish tanked. kill that you mentioned? <laughs> no. Yeah. Was that, was that well, the same if, timeline? It followed that. It, it followed it, yes. And, and that, so in 2011, 2012, it was, it was actually what I, what I liken to a perfect storm of events on the Potomac. And what it translated to people catching fewer bass. And as there are numerous stakeholders in this fishery, there was there was a lot of diversity of opinion on what was causing the problem. So at that point, we took the step to consider some regulatory changes. 
Um, We're still in 2009, correct? Just for no, 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 no. This was, so this would be 2011, 2012, 2012 right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so the, the fishery kind of fell off around 2011, 2012. People started noticing, and it remained pretty off until about 2014, 2015. And... Um, Anyway, there was a lot of diversity of opinion on what was was happening. And so at this point, you know, we were considering options. You know, do we need more outreach? Do we need to reach some people who are new to the fishery mm -hmm. um, with conservation care guidelines? Or do we need actual regulatory change? We are a regulatory agency. That's what the Department of Natural Resources is. So should we regulate this fishery differently? And we were considering those questions with the, the our roundtable, but we learned that what we needed was more of a formalized body of folks, people who were appointed by our sport fisheries advisory commission, who in turn is appointed by our secretary. So to kind of give them a little bit more of a formal voice in what we do um, as an agency. And so we created from the Black Bass uh, Roundtable, we created the Black Bass Advisory Committee. And that committee is a committee of sport fish um, advisory commission. And that group's the, the first one, and they uh, for for us, and they um, had a lot of debate on some of these issues, like the regulations. <laughs> stuff. He says it was wow. yeah, healthy yeah. debate. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of a lot of healthy. We had, you know presented the science, had a lot of discussions, um, and you know one of the things I think we learned from that, we learned a lot. I learned a lot personally, um, but one of the important things i think in terms of the fishery is that it's the potomac river specifically is managed by essentially four different agencies right Whew. so we have yeah so we have dc fisheries operating above woodrow wilson bridge right and then we have virginia operating their you know monitoring their streams as part of the their feeder streams to the potomac river on their side Maryland monitoring our feeder streams to the Potomac on our side. And then in the channel of the Potomac River, you got the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. That's not really that's, monitoring oh anything because they don't have that capability. So we have these four different groups kind of responsible for this one fishery. And no one's really talking to one. Well, we are talking to one another, but our data streams are not talking very well to one another because we're all doing different things yeah. to monitor it. Uh, for example, Virginia would, you know, they, they kind of, they had a snakehead survey uh, during the spring and they started collecting data on largemouth bass. We did, we have a largemouth bass survey during the fall and then we started collecting data on snakehead. So we kind of went about it two different ways. We were collecting similar data streams, but we had different seasons and different initiate, initiate, um, different initial reasons for the survey. So methodological issues kind of arose. And so, you know, as the agencies recognize that, we also recognize that some of us thought that there was a problem with the Potomac River fishery and some of us didn't. We needed to kind of all get onto the same page. And so in order, to, so, so when we decide to do that, um, the advisory committee recommended that we, um, the Black Bass Advisory Committee recommended that we all work together and create a good monitoring strategy um, that's interjurisdictional, and that is in fact what we did. And uh, we just issued the report to uh, Potomac River Fishery Commission this year. Um, I guess last last month, well, this month in July, and uh, it conveys the past three years of a tag recapture project that we had. So Virginia, D.C., and, and Maryland we all went out tagged a bunch of largemouth bass, and we um, asked anglers questions about their fishing days. I worked with tournaments on our side to examine recaptures of some of these tags, and we did that all really to estimate what abundance of bass is on, on the river. It's not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect strategy, and it was the first year of doing it, But and so there will be some small you, you changes started, moving though. forward, that, that's what's but important. we started. Yeah. And my hope <laughs> is that this is will continue for the next century, right? Because we have each of these agencies are all stakeholders mm -hmm. in this fishery. And um, we're all responsible for this fishery. 
And so I, in my opinion, we should all work together to monitor the fishery. So I'm very proud of what we've done. Uh, I think um, there will be some changes into next year. We're going to begin tagging again next spring. Um, we have a, a three-year cycle where we tag um, and um, one year visit tournaments, tag visit tournaments, and then report out and then analyze the data and report out uh, the following year. So um, you know, we've kind of got a strategy together. We'll tweak it, move forward, but I'm excited. Um, it's the only system in tidal water that we do this. Um, so, you know, I'm very hopeful that we will continue this in the next hundred years um, and be perhaps a, perhaps a beacon on how to handle this. Other such issues arise in this state. I mean, guys, this is just the biggest problem of so many cooks in the kitchen, and it is what it is, but to be able to pull the rope in the same direction it is so important. And I can't imagine, yeah. again, like the way that's cookie cuttered up, that is stressful to, to get it going the way the way that you have, which is amazing. Super stressful. <laughs> Plus, you know, you, you know, every, every one of us has an opinion on on mm -hmm. how we should do we're things. humans, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're all humans, whether you work for an agency or you fish for a living. And getting everyone to kind of agree to one particular strategy is not an easy task. I mean, look at what happens in Congress sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. With all the infighting there. You know, um, so that's why when I say I'm, I'm grateful that we've actually come to resolution, I mean it because it's not been easy to figure out. Plus, I will say, this is additional work on top of what we're already oh, doing. Yeah. I'm not, we, we, we have a fall bass survey where we target rivers, we have um, surveys and impoundments. We're not changing any of that. We're continuing that. So this is an additional load on top of what we're already doing. And asking other agencies to take on that additional load in addition to ours, and then having them agree to it, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Considering Considering how difficult it is to find time and, um, you know, still meet the responsibilities of doing everything else you're doing and you don't get extra pay for it. So, you know, I'm, I'm very excited um, that we got that together. And um, is the data available yet from the first three years? Is that available to the public yet to talk about? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so it is. I submitted the report to PRFC uh, this month and we may... They, Marty, Gary, had suggested last year that, you know, we go to PRC to present this report probably in August or September. At that point, obviously, it'll be it's a public meeting. Anyone can go. But I have not taken this report yet and posted it online. So we can I, wait. We can we can we can take pay that for another show when it becomes public. Yeah. Well, I, I intend on putting it. it there's nothing. I, you know, it's the first it's the first cycle, so there's probably nothing earth shattering in it. Um, where you know we we estimated um, roughly about a hundred thousand bass in the in the river, hundred thousand twelve inch or better bass in the river, and uh, that's probably correct. But what we're you know we're not going to be able to get fine scale on on how many fish are out there. It's just statistically, it's not possible to do that. But I think we're within the order of magnitude. And um, that will become an index that we can track over these next 100 years, mm -hmm. <laughs> 200 years. And if we start to see, you know, major changes in in abundance and our statewide surveys, likewise, indicate issues then collectively we can respond to those issues for this very important fishery, not only for Maryland, but also for the country. So. It's interesting when you mentioned 2010 and 2012, because actually the week that we're recording this, uh, the, the Bob Petty episode dropped and he has been running the Potomac team series out of Lisa Vineyard for like 30 years and he's data collected. And he even mentioned that in his catch weights for the Potomac team series. Like that's the law, that's the dip. But he's saying like, at least in his weights that it seems like the river has definitely bounced back since then and it's it doing has. much better yeah it has so um we've definitely seen that in the past certainly in the past three years um you know i think so you know some people argue well it's just cyclical it's it's just part That's of the part fishery of yeah yep. um i'm always interested in why 
rather than just kind of pointing to the pattern. And, uh, you know, I looked into it a bit, um, published a couple papers on it, talked about it. I think what happened is that uh, we had a lot of people fishing in 2009 and 2010. A mm. lot of people. We had grasses were pretty nice. People were catching fish. It was on fire. That's what I was told by the anglers. Um, they were they were doing really well. Uh, we ended up with slightly higher fishing mortality, uh, as we estimated, um, than usual. Maybe that's not such a big deal, right? When you get a lot of folks out on the water and they're catching fish, there's going to be catch and release mortality. Mm -hmm. There's also going to be mortality at the scale uh, if you're fishing a tournament. And that's just happens. And there may could, there could be harvest because some people do harvest, not many, some people do harvest largemouth bass. So um, higher fishing mortality happens sometimes periodically. What we need to counter that is good reproduction. And yeah. the problem that we ran into on the Potomac was that the grasses disappeared, <laughs> disappeared in 2011, 2012. They not disappeared, but they shrunk diminished, in area. Yeah. They diminished. And that led to reduction in reproduction. And if you, if you lose some of these older fish and then the fish that you have out there are not reproducing as well, then there's not a replenishment of your stock really until the habitat rebounds. So um, fishing mortality did go down, as you may expect. I, I, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, um, when the fishery, not tanked, but when, when people started catching fewer fish, they ended up moving to the upper Chesapeake Bay, they'd fish other areas, or there would be fewer people fishing the Potomac River. You know, maybe it's just not worth it to them. Um, and that did happen. We, we documented that. But that reduction in effort also reduced the number of people on the water and the level of fishing mortality. And that, that was great, but you really needed that habitat to come back in order for reproduction to, to, to happen. And that did happen. We, we ended up, the, you know, grasses are cyclical too, so they came back. It, that is so, yep. everyone I've interviewed since I started this show, every biologist, and that's the thing is like, everyone wants to have that golden thing. Like, how do you manage vegetation to where it'll grow? Because it seems like such a, it, it comes and it goes, but there's not much you can like, how do you incentivize it? And like, that's that mystery box thing there. Because yep. you're right, when those milfoil beds were like, you know, up near DC, when that used to be a carpet when I was a kid. And then oh. there, there, are, there are people have their reasons for why it disappeared, but then it disappears. And you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's such an interesting thing. Yeah, it's gone, you know, and, and you know, I, I work in the fishery, so I do a lot of discussion. I have a lot of discussion about grasses, right? Because we know how important they are in the Potomac and the Upper Bay. Um, you know, when you lose the seed bank, it's gone, um, you know, but I am sure there are a lot of reasons why you may lose a seed bank. Dredging, for example, might be one. The... The good news is, is that, you know, grasses, as I mentioned, these freshwater grasses, they recover pretty relatively quickly from issues, whether it's a salinity issue, water clarity issue, flooding, scarring, dredging, um, these, these plants can, can recover. We have a lot, we have, you know, pretty good diversity of grasses oh, yeah, out there yeah, too. Yeah. So when, if one species of grass is not doing so well, like sometimes Valisneria, um, wild celery might not be doing so well. You you'll have hydrilla that 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 f comes in. It does change the dynamic of of fishing, um, but you you can have this 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 grass repopulation, um, and that in part is owed because of the diversity of grasses out there. The the thing is, there's not really, as you know, a control for that. I remember back in 2011, 2012, when we were dealing with this issue. I was at the PRC meeting and one of the person said, well, why can't y'all just plant more grass or do something with the I've grass? I've been asked that question so many right. times. <laughs> right. And I, you know, I've been asked by, by folks, well, why can't you kill the grass? There's too much grass in here. You know, I can't move my boat to the dock. You know, I think uh, there are limits to what we can do, particularly in tidal water, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay tidal systems. I know impounded waters is different. People yeah, plant it, it, grasses yeah. there and, and they can remove grasses. They do that in Florida, right? doing in deep creek lake here right um and in, in tidal waters it's a little different uh you can't do that um 
the reality is from from my from my perspective the reality is i can't control what happens to the grass no you can't but i can try and understand what the consequences would be yeah. from a, a change in grass and that truly is actually really important i in my opinion because there are a lot of different narratives on what may be causing a problem right some of them are going to be fictional narratives some of them is going to be misinformation and we need to have a, a the most accurate narrative that we can't have and if i know for example how bass respond to grass right and grasses disappear then i can create the narrative of what's going to happen to bass fishing and then have support for that narrative um through science and studies and such and then that is that drives the conversation you know if we don't have that then people are claiming space aliens or mm -hmm. theft or you know so, something else is going on out there snakeheads are destroying the environment and so now we have oh, that right that was yeah. Fun, yeah yeah so you know we have to we have to you know even if i can't control even if we cannot control what happens with grasses it's good to understand what these interrelationships are so that we can create some you know good narratives when mm -hmm. there are problems um but that, that said i put i put all that we definitely the state and maryland department of environment definitely have initiatives to try and protect grasses right <laughs> you know there are some that you're not a lot like they're endangered grasses or things like that that you cannot touch yeah well look we there there we we definitely value grass recovery and grass populations in the state whether it's brackish water grasses saltwater grasses freshwater grasses right so there are a lot of protections in place for them right um I think, and there, in some cases, replantings that happen in the state. So I don't want to give the impression that people aren't doing things with grass oh, no, or no, trying no, to yeah, protect yeah. them. They are. It's just sometimes things can be out of our control, and um, particularly like maybe a, a strong spring flood event yep. or water quality things of that ilk. Like you, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Some things just are. But it's one pillar to a good bass spawn and the other is the spawn itself and yep. you know best segue ever for supplemental stocking i, yeah. mean, I mean like right there guys because yeah. uh, that is like the two tails of it any fishery whether it's the, the, the major fish kill that we've covered on the shenandoah river that happened when i was a kid it comes down to you know w what is the water quality like the habitat and then boom it's the spawning class of fish to be able to have that cycle repeat and so many people, if you look at the Texas uh, fishing game or Gunnersville or even what Virginia did with the James, like there's this, this supplemental stocking program in, involved. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. just something I've always wanted to like pick your brain about with, of course, the Potomac River and just your thoughts and w what that's like here. Yeah. So, you know, um, we do stock bass on the Potomac River. And I think uh, and there maybe it's not as necessary um only and i say that because we do have a lot of really great habitat in the potomac and a lot of really good natural reproduction so in general that system can replenish itself um pretty effectively as compared to other systems in the chesapeake bay where we lack grasses or we lack the capacity for really good reproduction and in those systems, stocking is more effective. And I would point to a place like Gunpowder River, Middle mm -hmm. River, where that's where that's you know really played out, where we've noted that stocking there has made a significant impact they had on a that fish fishery. kill, right? Middle River had a fish kill ten years ago ish. Well, yeah, that no, it wasn't it was. that long ago. But um yes, there were <laughs> but there were actually two. Oh, it was um, two. Okay. Yeah. And and uh, that's I guess a, a different a different but worse that's where supplemental stocking but, would be important is if you did have for some reason some massive fish kill yeah yeah right well especially if especially if we know that reproduction is limited in that system and that the the capacity of that population to replenish itself to the fishery that we want it to be is not um there if we if we don't have that then yes stocking becomes important right and uh middle river gunpowder river yeah then you know but the the flip side of that is there were definitely people saying why would you stock fish to middle river knowing 
knowing that there was a fish kill out there caused by, you know, a, a, a basically plankton. Why, why would you do that? You're just going to end up killing those young fish, right? Yeah, so that there is there is always you as can't I said, win. opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's always yeah. differences of opinion. Nonetheless, on the on the Middle River and Gunpowder River, we 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 continue to stock because um, environments do change, and it's not, I, in my opinion, a good enough reason to stop stocking just because you have you know um, one fish kill or two fish kills related to, to plankton. I mean, we don't want to stop management just because of that. So um, stocking out there has been very effective. The thing with stocking in, in some of these cases is that one thing we've seen and, and others across the country have seen is that if you were going to do it, you have to have a committed program to it. You can't just yeah. do a one and done thing. So if you want it to be effective, right, it has to, you have to continue to do it unless, unless you expect the habitat, again, the capacity of the habitat to improve to the point where the population mm. can self-sustain. If we have limits on that uh, habitat capacity and we may write in some of our urbanized areas where you know the the system is where it is and we're not the water clarity is where it is and we're not likely going to see you know improvements in grass etc um in some areas where there are those capacity limits routine stocking is necessary in order to keep that fishery at the level you want it to be uh, at least that's what we've seen in tidal waters. Now, in non-tidal systems, impoundments, the story could be very different, right? Because, you know, those fish are trapped, essentially. The, the size uh, you're dealing with. Yeah. You know. In the Chesapeake Bay, these water in the tidal basin, these waters are all connected to one another. So if you have overpopulation uh, in a particular area, the density dependence, right, these fish can move out of those areas. Um, if you're in an impoundment, it's less likely because, you know, it's an impoundment. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, that, then you end up with st stunted fish and or things like where that. Where are you going right? to get the most bang for your buck? I mean, like that's. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think in, in, in it depends, right? Because in impoundments. Because I know like with your walleye stocking program and I've had, you know, Mr. Mulligan on and I've had uh, Matt who runs Deep Creek where it's like, do we, where do you want to put that resource? The Upper Potomac, Deep Creek, like, because yeah. again, it's not like, it's not like you have like unlimited money and resources and then those decisions have to be made, which is yes. another stressor that, that goes into it. Yeah, I, I, you know, absolutely. Um, honestly, it comes in my, you know, my opinion, it comes down to angling. Um, angler demand and where you where you want to put those fish. Um, you know, sometimes the louder voices do get the most fish. You know, um, sometimes it, you know it comes down to a regional manager, a biologist saying, "I want to create a fishery here. I want to support this fishery here." Uh, there are definitely um, sometimes it's political, <laughs> but you know, that's right? The, yes, that's the reality sometimes, of life. That's the yeah. reality of life, yeah. right? Um, you know, I think. In, in, in our case, for example, with the Potomac, we want to continue sustaining that population because, you know, of all thing, of all those things, it, it likely would be political because there's so much attention to the to the Potomac. Yeah. But there are a lot of anglers out there who demand access to that resource. So um, we do attend to the Potomac River as the Upper Bay and Gunpowder River um, because those fisheries people care about, they talk about. Um, and they want to continue to fish them. So we do try and allocate resources where we can. And even, you know, and in, in to the eastern shore and some of our systems as well. But as you said, particularly on the Marshy Hope, which is what I'm thinking now, where we've seen some struggles in the past two years, three years, not just us, but also Delaware um, Resource Agency there. Um, you know, we do try and access resource, but they are expensive or um, stock fish, but but they are expensive to buy. And uh, now you could probably talk to Maryland Bass Nation because they spend a lot of money on getting big bass for the Middle River and Gunpowder River. They can they can be really pricey. How does that work, if I may ask? Um, so if, if they come to you and like we want to stock, you know, 2000 that are over 15 inches long, what have you. Right. Is that something that that they do separately or is that something that they give you the funds and then you do it like how, how does that work? Yeah, so it's, it, it could be complicated. Um, but with Maryland Bass Nation, we have a really good relationship with them. And um, technically, technically, they should have a stocking permit um, okay. from the state to do that, uh, to, to, to stock fish. And uh, as part of that permit, they purchase those, they're, they're required to purchase those fish through a state approved vendor. And that's important because 
we want to make sure that it's say if they're buying largemouth that it's largemouth bass that they're actually putting in the river and not yeah. florida bass and not alabama bass right we want to make sure that's, that they're yeah. right that they're putting the correct species in there and that's why we ha and not just to say that it also should be disease free we don't want to be introducing a new pathogen into our waters that could potentially cause a problem with for for other bass population uh for other fish in the bass population or other fish in the ecosystem so we do have a permitting process now in that in this case say for example maryland bass nation they want to go and purchase fish they find that vendor they get the permit they find a vendor okay yep. gotcha, gotcha. yep yep we have a list of approved vendors online um generally they work with with one person who, who we also work with and um they get the fish and then oftentimes what they do is they have their uh fish club members um bass club members stock the fish that so they'll get fish and they'll they'll stock them and i usually issue them a permit because oftentimes they would be holding bass that are smaller than minimum size regulation would allow, or mm, they could be holding more yeah. bass, right? More than the five fish yeah. creel that, that huh. they would otherwise be allowed. So I issue each of those people a, a permit in case natural resource police roll up on them and see a bunch of little <laughs> fish at their live well. So we definitely have to stay involved in that process, yeah. but we don't have to do it for them. They can, they can do it. There have been problems in the past, like in the 90s, where bass clubs would just buy fish and put them in the river. And that's why we have Florida bass hybrids in our rivers now, because they would be buying these Florida bass hybrids and they would stick them in the river. So are we talking like the F1, basically? Yeah. Yep. That's what we're talking. And we still have those genes. We're doing it. We just did that testing. We, we know that Florida bass genes have persisted in our ecosystem. In fact, there are a lot of them in the Potomac River. So anyone who thinks we should be stocking Florida bass is let them know that we already have Florida bass integrates in our rivers, so we don't necessarily need to be stocking any Florida bass. The The reality of the situation is if a bass club wants to get into a stocking program, they can do it. In fact, I'm, I'd be grateful for it, but we definitely have to work together. Um, they'd need the stocking permit and likely a, a permit from us to, to handle more more fish than regulation would otherwise allow. So we definitely work together, but they can do it on their own I, I don't have to be there um and vice versa you know we stock fish um sometimes maryland bass nation have, hel have helped us stock fish you know they on the chop tank river on the, the that middle really helps the logistics for you guys having that it, help absolutely because it's more boats on the water and they can yeah. take the fish and they can go out with them so it it helps it also helps with the conversation right mm, because we're trying to build yeah. relationships here with people and um stocking is something that everyone seems to enjoy it's not the only tool we use you can visually <laughs> see it it's almost like cutting your lawn right. the satisfaction yeah. of you you can see results yes. that you put it in yeah well yeah and you hope that they live after yeah, right yeah, you know yeah. yeah but that but that's the thing it's not the only tool but it's the tool that people like to talk about because maybe you're right maybe they can see it happening and um they feel like they're making a difference uh you know but it is expensive and so we um we were lucky enough uh, to have the president of Maryland Bass Nation actually pitch uh, to legislators in the, in the, in the Senate and House, uh, House of Delegates in Maryland, uh, Black Bass Conservation Fund and idea. And this conservation fund is actually a direct line of funding to support black bass conservation in the state. And it was signed by the governor this year. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a, actually, you have no idea how long of a process this was. It actually, for years, we've been talking about black bass stamps and how people can donate directly to black bass work. It's been challenging. But now, now we actually have the process. And anyone who gets their license online or go, knows how to work Compass online can go on Compass and can donate, if they want, any amount of money they want to black bass conservation in the state. And we would use that money for purchasing fish for stocking, for example. I wanted to create a, an artificial reef out in one of our impoundments in Western Maryland, but I couldn't because I couldn't get the money. Um, so uh, you know, maybe this would allow us to build some of these artificial reefs that other states like North Carolina is using mm -hmm. in impoundments. Maybe we could do that with this money. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to to seeing how what the progress is. You know, I just donated five dollars. I don't know how much anyone else has donated yet, but we do have a direct access to to knowing that. And 
uh, we're planning on sharing that information with, you know, what the donations are with our Black Bass Advisory Committee um, at least every year, but maybe quarterly. Oh, wow. And uh, that way we can work with our Black Bass Advisory Committee on specific ideas for projects like a reef out in, you know, Little Seneca or some some, some area, um, some impoundment or buying fish to stock in, in a place like Middle River, or now we're talking about Still Pond, actually, hmm. um, on the Eastern Shore. So, you know, we we would, we would we have that potential capacity, um, and we get, you know, input from some of the stakeholders in the fishery, as well as from our agency biologists, all working together from a fund that could help black bass conservation. Do in you the have state. a financial goal that you would like to hit in 2024, 2025, or is that a thought that maybe that'll that'll be released at some point? Hey, I would I would love to see as much money get pumped, <laughs> and I have no limits. You can you want to donate a million dollars? You could do that. I don't know how deep your pockets are, <laughs> yeah. but I'm happy to walk you through the process. Um, I, you know, I remember going to the conservation directors meeting for BASS a couple of years ago, and um, they were talk. Pennsylvania was talking about uh, their fund. They have a similar voluntary fund for black bass, and it, I think they had about sixty, seventy thousand dollars in it. I don't know we, what we would have, but I will say this: I will say this. We have a lot of of tournaments coming to the state, out-of-state tournaments coming to the state, Major League Fishing, ABA, you know, BASS, um, a lot of anglers fishing our waters, and our fishing license, I don't know if you've looked, it's really cheap compared, at least our tidal fish water license is yeah. for Chesapeake Bay Coastal Sport, it's very cheap compared to other states like Pennsylvania, Jersey. I'm just going to say, if you feel... The desire to support black bass fishing now you have your opportunity to do that just by donating a dollar five dollars fifty cents whatever you want to donate um through that fund while you're buying your fishing license it, it's so weird when you mention it it's like you're getting your house ready and then bass comes in to the party wrecks the place and then leaves and and you know it, it's so interesting when you have these major organizations and you're trying to bring them into the state and it would be nice almost in a perfect world where they could have a fund themselves since bass or you know major league fishing is such a massive organization that they can help donate money back to these fisheries when you do have a 300 boat tournament yeah all these people you know because it's such a weird dynamic with them coming in and then they're using your resource and sometimes there's a little mortality that happens but you get the press but it's like yeah, like that's such a weird thing to deal with. Yeah, well, you know, and I, I at the start of this, I was talking about Mattawoman Creek and the 500 fish. The reality is we didn't really have an easy process at that point for people to donate money for black bass conservation. Yeah. Um, now we have that. And, I, you know, honestly, these large tournaments and even small tournaments are very important for the state in terms of economic revenue. They generate a lot of money for the counties um, and for the businesses there. And I personally love the promotion of the fishery on the national stage as well as the local stage, right? Um, so there's a lot of value mm -hmm. already for these folks coming in to fish. That said, I would welcome their donation <laughs> if they wanted to drop it you know five dollars into the into the pot uh to support um something in the state whether it's a reef or whether it's um you know more bass that that we we purchase you know i was talking about this tagging project for the potomac river where dc virginia and, and us and prc are all working together we don't have a funding source for that like the the tags i have to you know kind of beg money for because we don't have that really you know well funded um you know maybe it would be nice it, to I, have a funding stream that would I, support that monitoring i've just always thought of that like for example is like the james river where they did they you know virginia and private people did immense stocking for so many years and bass came there for like 30 years in a row and it's like okay we, we built this really good fishery and we want you guys to show it off but on the same time it's like we, can we have some like symbiosis here and you can help back a little bit because you are then there on the water four or five hundred boats and it's like what would the perfect world be and it would yeah. be like yeah bass you're a massive organization 
yeah. we want you to come use the water, but on the same token, let's make sure we replenish this resource that you guys love. And that's kind of like my perfect world, yeah. which would never <laughs> exist. Well, no, look, it, I I think it's not just your perfect world. That's that's the kind of statements I've been hearing for years from bass anglers here in the state, right? Um, whether they're fishing bass tournaments, charter bed guys, recreational, whoever, even agency biologists, I've heard that argument it's nothing new to me um the like i said bass let's say i'm not picking on me i love bass mm -hmm. um, but let's say they come to the state and they have a 200 boat elite series i'm like love it right because yeah. it's promotion massive it's, promotion. it's economic um induced economic spending we have you know restaurants and hotels that are booked by people thank you thank you for doing that um it does help, though, to consider that, you know, the money that's going into that business is not necessarily going into supporting the black bass fishery, mm -hmm. right? Um, our money for black bass management is tied to license sales. That's big. Yeah. And I'm just saying that compared to other states in this country, license sales in the state of Maryland relatively low <laughs> and we just we just don't have as many people buying licenses as say you do in florida oh, or texas like, yeah like yeah. yeah you just don't so the revenue is kind of baselined here and that revenue by the way is shared by stripe bat by everyone and that's what's so, so crazy but you have this fishery that's literally nationally ranked yeah and so you're like a smaller state yep. but then everyone wants to come here yes. and that's just like the numbers don't add up well and, for your and, job. and that's why it's difficult <laughs> and and so there maybe there's this mentality that and it, it could very well be and i get it that it's a catch and release fishery so it doesn't really require a lot of maintenance and i'm i'm here to say that that's incorrect right there's a lot of maintenance that goes into managing a catch and release fishery and i get it we we might want to back off and say well it's it's not it's not as complicated as managing striped bass and that may be true but with largemouth bass fishery management, not only do we have to deal with, you know, perhaps fishing mortality, delayed mortality at a tournament, or um, catch and release mortality on the water, those kinds of things, but we have a lot of outreach that we do. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of materials that we have to get out to to anglers. We have a permitting system now for 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 directors, right? Um, and that permit is free, and we turn it out in two weeks, and other directors who are getting permits from Pennsylvania takes longer. So, you know, we're, we're doing that and that's all pro bono. That's on top of everything else we're doing. So we work on board release boats, right? To make sure that the conditions there are satisfactory for the fish, right? We have water quality meters that we, we go out and monitor these fisheries and we have staff that spend a lot of time to do these kinds of things. And we're always trying to push the envelope and learn more about the bass fishery and learn more about products that bass anglers can use, um, that we can supply, that we can work with them to supply. And that costs money and time and uh, maintenance. And so even though we have a catch and release fishery that people say, oh, we're throwing the fish back in the water. So why do we even need a resource agency to monitor it. Well, we do because catch and release fishery management can be as complicated as any of our other fisheries. Um, and we already talked about the habitat dependency mm -hmm. here. So, you know, you want to protect this fishery. I want to protect this fishery. Um, we want the fishery to sustain, right? So that every year BASS looks to the Potomac River yeah. as a destination fishery. We want that to happen. Sometimes it doesn't always happen, but when it doesn't happen, we want it to get back as quickly as possible to where it was. And that requires time and money. And, and really, in, in the, my last thought on that to put a pin in this, because I really do want to talk about the Eastern Shore, is the F1 and how the doc talk is always anywhere you go about stocking this so you can catch a 30 pound for five, blah, blah, blah. Um, I yeah. mean, just what, what are your thoughts? just more just like, what are your thoughts on the F1? Cause like you even mentioned it, like the genes mm -hmm. are already mixed mm -hmm. is buying the <laughs> F1 even like from, let's say a financial standpoint, like it's probably way more expensive, just let alone to buy that versus something else. Not to mention the ecological issues. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
I know that there's a lot of opinions here too. I, I understand that Virginia stocks F1s, for example, in some of their systems. Um, and there's a lot of debate across the country. Yeah, I've seen is. it, like, you know, from, from, from the Midwest down to Texas. I, I get it. Um, based on the research we've seen and, uh, you know, what I've, what I've learned is that stocking F1s in Maryland waters doesn't really do more for us than stocking Micropterus salmoides, the you know the, the largemouth bass. Um, maybe in some areas like Florida, where Florida bass evolved and adapted, southern states where the temperatures are more conducive to the growth of perhaps a, a species with those genes, maybe there they get bigger and faster. I've seen that research. I believe that's true. And that may be true even of some systems in Virginia. But in, in Maryland waters, we haven't seen it. We haven't documented it. Um, I do know that in the Midwest, you know, they've documented poor reproduction as a result of stocking F1s. I'm not interested in just a, uh, in some of these systems as a, um, you know, a routine stocking because that gets expensive. So if we can put in, if we can supplementally stock these populations and have them sustain themselves, that's ideal versus stocking it every year, every three years. Yeah. And I'm not going to put in an F1 that's not going to reproduce as well as a northern, what people call northern strain largemouth bass uh, into the water. Because if I can put in the northern strain bass and they will reproduce, I'd rather do that. That's more cost effective, yeah. you know, in terms of, you know, bang for your buck that's yeah and that, right? that's the thing i'd add because the f1 mm -hmm. it's it's a one generational thing that you're going to get the six or seven pounder those mm -hmm. genes not necessarily are going to be transferred Correct. over so then you have to think about that you're stocking something and then it's like you're not even going to get the benefit in 10 15 years because that's not even passing those genes down i know yep. with, with the texas system the reason their lunker program is so big is because they're specifically wanting you to bring in the genetics that they can pass on of that 10 pounder and i'm a which is different way I, different yeah i'm a huge fan of that lunker let me yeah. tell you i would love to have of, you know, talking about money and conservation, yeah. <laughs> but I would love to have a Lunker program here, right? Mm -hmm. Where we do something similar to what Texas, because I, I understand genetics, I get it. If we had bigger fish in our hatcheries where, and, and use those bigger fish to reproduce smaller fish, right? Their offspring and then stock those offspring. A lot of those offspring would carry along those genes, yeah. right? And that that's wonderful but it is expensive mm -hmm. because you have to feed those lunkers yep. and you have to contain those lunkers. And uh, while we do have, you know, facilities that could do it, it is not cheap to feed them and care for them. Um, but, you know, we get conservation fund money. <laughs> no, <laughs> Maybe one day we'll I, get it. I think this is important for people to know. <clears throat> so when you're at the boat ramp, it's like, we'll just do this. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, that one thing is the tip of the iceberg of how you get there. And yeah. this is what you have to spend to get there. And that's yeah. so important. And yeah, I was really big on the F1. I do think what Texas do, that that's the that's the standard of like, if you really want to have generational success, you just basically throw money at the wall <laughs> until until you have that. But yeah. Well, you know, and it's not it's not as if... You know, when people say throw money at the wall, sometimes I think, well, you know, we don't really know how to do it. So we're just going to try a bunch true, of different things true. and see what happens here. You know, we do have some states who were successful in some of these initiatives, and it's a matter of building that infrastructure to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. And we yes. just need the money to get that infrastructure. And as I said, we are at what my boss love he is his two favorite words i think are level funding because we are at level funding and we're not getting any more right unless we have a huge influx of license sales in the state which probably won't happen so we're at level funding and the and donations too with with the new black bass too correct with the what with the uh, the donations people can do now with the black yeah, bass, yeah. so the donations would be on top of level funding and that's what i'm excited that's about big. because yeah. we could use that money this level funding every year doesn't change right it's not it's not like we get you know we get cost of living increases it's not like you get cost yeah. of living increases in funding so we get this baseline funding and we already have the programs the infrastructure built in right people are getting paid more people sometimes it, it, we have we have equipment that that ages out and we have to buy more equipment and so all of that 
actually pulls money away from that level funding. That sucks. So there's no there, there's no real there's no real additional funding for huh. these other things we're talking about, like the tagging program on the Potomac River or the stocking program on the gunpowder. You know, yeah, I get it. We could buy 12 inch bass and stock them mm -hmm. in the river. That would be a benefit to you. Absolutely. 100 percent agree. Who's going to pay for those fish? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep, so, yep, yep, yep. right. So, you know, it's not as if we have, um, we don't have as deep a pockets as maybe some people think. And um, just because, you know, I pay taxes doesn't mean all my money is, <laughs> is dedicated mm -hmm. to black bass research. But this is why this is so important, such big news that people can now donate. So, yes. you know, if you want to see the budget, you know, swell and be able to get projects done, you know, again, link in the episode description to where you can donate, uh, of course, with everything that we talked about today. But that's big for the fisheries around here. That's awesome. It's big for the state. It's the first yeah. time. First time. You know, we, we talk about. We have a trout stamp, right, in the state. And, and if you buy a trout stamp, you can harvest trout. And that money is used to pay for stocking trout in the state, right? Get it. We have nothing and have had nothing for black bass like that. Mm -hmm. Now we have something. And fingers crossed, people will pay attention to it. And just at more end on a, a more uplifting note just about fishing in general, we all talk about the Potomac River. Even before recording, we talked about this. If, if, you're, if you're in Florida, you know about the Potomac. Do you know about the Eastern shore? Do you mm -hmm. know really about, you know, gunpowder? Like there are so many other fisheries around here that, mm. that you, that you have control over. Um, and specifically talking about the Eastern shore, I'm yep. always thinking about the beach and just chilling, but not fishing. <laughs> like what, yeah. what, what opportunities <laughs> are out that way? <laughs> well, you know, you're not going to get it. I mean, I guess if you go to ocean city, you probably won't hook into largemouth yeah. bass off the coast, but, uh, you know, there, there are definitely some great fishing opportunities on the Eastern shore. Um, you know, people fish Johnson's Pond a lot, right? Um, so we have a lot of farm ponds, um, some, some, you know, a lot of them private. But if you get, you know, access rights, um, talk to the landowner, you can fish those ponds. And uh, you can pull out some really nice sized fish. Actually, farm pond fishing is one of the more popular ways that people are fishing huh. for bass in, in the state. And the Eastern Shore does, 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 does offer that That's opportunity. You know, my job tends to focus more on tidal rivers. So that's, you know, what I'm more familiar with. But I would say, you know, places like Johnson's Pond um, are, are great, and that's near Salisbury, are great for, you know, learning how to fish for bass and um, hooking into a bass. So it's great. It's also good for snakeheads now. So it's not like you're just going to be catching bass when you're out there. In the tidal rivers... You know, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge for folks because you, a lot of times you need a boat. Um, it's harder to fish a bass off of a dock sometimes. Um, and boats, kayaks, kayak fishing for bass, it's really exploded. It's exploded. I love it. Mm -hmm. You have, I love it when I see like this, this explosion of a new type of the fishery, right? Um, for a few reasons. One is it adds allows us to re-promote it and rebrand the fishery, which is great. Um, and it gives more people access to yeah. it. And that is and really important to me. Which I think is the wave of the future. The technology yeah. is getting better. Yeah. And it's it's actually opened up competitive sport fishing in a way that wasn't when I started this job, right? When I started this job, people were talking about, well, you know, paper tournaments. That's the word paper tournaments. Right? Yeah, I get it. But there were a lot of problems with paper tournaments, right, in terms of security and, 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 and you need to have a small club because you want to have a big club and all that um, because, of, you know, people didn't trust one another. But now we have technology, right? We have um, Facebook, iTournament, these kinds of apps that, that can be used for um, basically digitizing what you catch and when you catch it and where you catch it, right? Fantastic. Um, and for for kayaks, mm -hmm. this is great because they don't have live wells. Yep. They're not bringing those fish back to the dock. So now we have hundred. We we have tournaments out there for kayak. We have you know maybe a little over a hundred people fishing these larger tournaments on the Potomac River and in the Upper Chesapeake Bay, and they are fishing you know, from kayaks without live wells, catch an immediate release. They take photos with, and this is perfect for. Not only does it minimize minimize the stress on the fish, mm -hmm. right? You're not putting them in a live well. You don't have to worry about caring for the fish all day. 
um, which is great for the angler because they don't want to kill the fish, right? Yeah. They, honestly, I've talked to the, they don't want to kill the fish. So, um, you know, it, it minimizes stress there, but it also allows kayak anglers, this catch fighter release idea, allows them to fish during the closed season, right? Yep. So we have closed season yep. in our impounded waters, right? Like Conowingo Reservoir, right? Um, like Johnson's Pond, we have trophy, <laughs> trophy fishing over there. And uh, it's closed during the spring. And you can have a competitive sport fishing tournament there if you, you know, use catch photo release. Same thing in, in Conowingo Reservoir, same thing in Deep Creek Lake, right? If you don't want to fish trophy regulations, right? Say you want to bring in, you want to, all of your fish to matter. You want all of your 10, you know, 15 inch, 16 inch, 17 inch fish to matter. You can do that with catch photo release and some of our trophy managed um, impoundments, which is great. If you're fishing tidal waters during the spring, right, you're likely to hit a 12 inch, 13 inch fish. If you want them to count in your in your in your you know bag, so to speak, uh, during our 15 inch minimum season, you can do that with a catch photo release. So it opens up the opportunity to weigh more fish or have more fish count. Um, during your competitive spot. And you can use kayaks mm -hmm. without light, which is fantastic because we have so many people out there who are kayak fishing uh, now. So honestly, I, I love that. And on the Eastern shore, um, kayak fishing is still popular. We don't see as many kayak tournaments out there though. You, largely those are Upper Bay and Potomac. Um, the fishing on the shore is probably not as well discussed it's not right but you can and i maybe don't want to give away secrets here, yeah but, i know but I, <laughs> I, like i'm a state agency so everything's an open door <laughs> open, open, open. so um you know we have seen some really nice fish on places like you know our sassafras river right i was out there um if you can get to them um the wakamako has got really a kind of a smaller fishery but you can get some big fish i Blackwater area too. Blackwater. Well, I'll say this about Blackwater because <laughs> I've worked out at Blackwater now for a few years. The bass fishery there is not as good. Um, I, I don't, you can kayak and it's a beautiful area to kayak, right? That's a great thing about the Eastern Shore, right? I, in my opinion, yeah, bass fishing is good in some areas. May not be as good as the upper Chesapeake Bay or the Potomac or even gunpowder where you can find slews of bass, right? Um, it may not be as good as those. But the scenery is fantastic. So if you're looking for a rustic, chill day of just fishing, right, you can find some nice areas on, on the eastern shore. You can go to the Pocomoke. You may not be rolling into the big fish like you would in the upper bay, but they still have some bass tournaments down there. And you can still find some nice-sized fish on the, on the, on the Pocomoke, um, like around the Snow Hill area. I mean, we have a survey out there, so, so I know about that. Um, it's not as many fish, but you can find some nice fish out there. Uh, the Wacomica has a little bit more of a challenge because of the, the size of the habitat that really bass proliferate in. So, um, maybe around the Salisbury area is usually where we, we see the mo most around the hospital area and the little, you know, but they can, it can be a little bit more of a challenge. So usually I, I tell people, if you want to fish the Eastern shore systems, maybe look to the Pocomoke, maybe look to the Nanticoke and Marshy Hope. Now. Marshy Hope's beautiful, beautiful system. Hmm. Very rustic, gorgeous. I don't know if you've been there. No. Okay. This is all new to me right now. <laughs> all right. Well, I will tell you, it is a, it's a, it's a beautiful system. It's a little like the Pocomoke, um, but it's very different. The Pocomoke's more of like a cypress swamp area, so it's really kind of unique, oh, and that's cool. gorgeous. Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, Marshy Hope doesn't really have that, but. It is a gorgeous system because it's not very highly developed. Lots of um, tree shoreline. You know, you just don't have the the grasses there like you would in the upper bay. Mm -hmm. So it's a different style of fishing uh, if you're fishing for for bass. Um, but you can kayak it, you can bass boat it, and um, you can find some nice fish there. And they do have bass tournaments out of it because they they know and and out of Del Delaware too, Sharptown area as well. Um, they they have bass tournaments, but we have noticed the agencies there have noticed a, a, a change <laughs> in the population and we're about to release a video kind of documenting this on on facebook and we've noticed kind of a change in the number of fish that we're getting in our survey both adults and juveniles 
and it's a decline, which is hmm. not altogether awesome that both agencies are noticing this. Is it salinity? No, it's not. Uh, I know that um, we s did see something similar related to salinity uh, on the Chester and the Chop Tank back in 2002, 2003, when we had drought. I know that Virginia noticed similar things on the James. Uh, I believe it was the James and the Rappahannock. And, um, you know, the salinity there got higher because of the drought. Um, that's changed. You know, with the Chop Tank and the Chester, they've really improved for bass fishing. I would encourage people to reconsider those, those areas. The Nanticoke didn't really see that higher salinity level. Um, we're not actually altogether sure what, what the issue is. I know that both Delaware and ourselves have pointed to major ecological disturbances like the proliferation of uh, blue catfish and the introduction of snakehead in the area. Um, those are major ecological changes to that system. It's harder to draw the lines to how that might have affected the bass fishery. Um, but Salisbury University is doing some work on food web hmm. um, relationships in that system so that maybe we can better diagnose some of these things. Um, not really sure what the issue is. What I do know is that both Delaware and Maryland have been stocking fish out there for the past uh, couple of years. Wow. Again, funding can be, well, Maryland side, Delaware more routinely does. It is uh, expensive to do that, but we have been um, working on getting that money to, to put fish out there to try and revitalize the fishery and see if that helps. Um, unfortunately, if there's something going on with mortality and natural mortality, um, particularly for the, ad the adults, um, you know, it's harder to solve that problem without knowing what causing what's causing that problem. We don't have a lot of fishing effort out there, so I can't just point to, you know, um, you know, anglers and say, hey, treat your fish better. It's not a matter of that. Something else is is up, I think, we think, and Delaware thinks it's related to reproduction. We don't know what the problem there is and whether it's related to invasives or, or something else, but we know that that's an issue. Right now, we're dealing with it with stocking. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not altogether convinced that that's going to solve the issue, but we are monitoring it. And we do have surveys out there. So anyway, I, I guess I wouldn't point people to the Nanticoke right now. <laughs> so I guess that's a long-winded way of saying there are better systems on the eastern shore to focus on. Uh, and uh, I might suggest, you know, the, you know, if you're not, if you don't want to go all the way down to the Pocomoke, maybe look to the Chester, look to the Sass, um, look to the Chop Tank, particularly the upper part of the Chop Tank. Uh, we have seen some, some that fishery, those fisheries had some struggles, but they are coming back, so. Joe, I, I really appreciate you spending the time with me. I mean, it was fine when, when we do these, I always think like, well, we get 40 minutes in and you could go three hours, because it's just not only like, it's fascinating what you do, it's the breath. It's the area that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it's not just the Potomac River, and it's not just this one little issue. It's just a web, and it's just so crazy. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about the problems with smallmouth on the non-tidal Potomac or the issues out at Deep Creek Lake and Liberty. So, um, look, I, I just, I'd say that, you know, we, we have a lot of good people who are working on this in the agency. Uh, we also have a lot of good anglers mm -hmm. and motivated anglers. And, um, you know, I was talking to a boat fishing captain last night. And I said, you know, one of the values behind the bass fishery is that we have so much division, debate, but unification. They speak with one voice. You know, the, the bass anglers, they all really do care about bass. And when there are issues, they come together about bass. And that's helped us um, kind of work together and solve some of these issues. So it's not really just about you know, the agency doing this. It's about us working with the stakeholders, mm -hmm. right? The other stakeholders. Um, a lot of them are anglers and uh, and working toward, you know, solving these issues. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky in that. Some of the other fisheries, they don't have that. Um, or there's so much debate and division that it prevents that. But within within bass fishing, you know, there's a lot of contentious debate 
but generally we all really do care about the resource and that's what we're working for. Yeah, and I remember when I had a river keeper on and he said, if you see something, say something. And I remember, I think it was a BFL this year, there was some kind of netting or whatever. And I had like 200 calls about covering this and it's like, mm -hmm. you don't have any proof. We are on the iPhone like 19. If you're out on the water, just take a picture, record it. Yeah. Because it's this he said, she said stuff. And I think bass fishing are really bad about that drama. It's like, just pull your phone out and say like, is this an issue? And you, then you have proof. You know, you say that, but on the, on the chick this year. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> on the chick this year, back in May. Oh, that was it. Yeah, uh huh. Yes. Yep. We had, we had motivated bass anglers taking pictures of um, what they thought was something probably wrong. why I started that. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, of the hall sailing that was happening on the Chickamauxin on the Potomac. They were taking pictures of what's going on. They, they called my boss, they called me. Um, what they were, what the hall sailors were doing was, was legal and they, mm -hmm. they were legally out there fishing and that's fine. Of course, then what happened afterwards with the dead fish on the water didn't make my life any easier. We did end up with, uh, sent our crews that we had 82 dead bass on the water as a result of that activity. And that's just what we counted. Um, so that's an issue. And, you know, I, like, like I said earlier, catch and release fishery management ain't easy. Mm -hmm. And there are still issues that we face. And this is just, you know, this one in May was just one of them. It was just the optics were bad. And it's just, yeah. did you have to net the day of a BFL? Like that was not, that, Tough was, day. that was not a good idea. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> yeah. pick your days better. Yeah. But look, I, I'm a big supporter of um, people's a access to fisheries mm -hmm. and in general. And I have no issues with commercial harvesting of want to harvest let them do it but there are optics to pay attention to look i i say the same thing about people who hunt deer and they leave yes. their <laughs> dead bleeding yes. deer in their pickup truck yeah you can you can do that i think legally but the optics are bad mm. and you gotta you gotta sadly enough you know in this day where everyone's got their own video camera mm. and they can upload it live stream it right away um you got to be thoughtful about those optics and uh, in this case, I'm, you know, I'm not one of these guys who really kind of gravitate around the, around that issue, as much as I did the dead fish on the water. That's really what yeah. bothered me. Mm -hmm. You know, they they could, as far as I'm concerned, if you want to showcase and say, look, I don't like that this person's doing that or this person's doing that. All right, that's your right. You can say that. It's not illegal. It's not illegal. But when they're dead bass during the spawning season in a creek where we where we know where we have regulations protecting bass spawning that's when i really get frustrated and start to consider what we can do to address that issue so it doesn't happen again um, we did this not finger pointing to these folks we did this um, in 2009 when we lost all those bass as a result of the tournament, we figured out what the issue was and remedied it. Ended up with a permitting sy system. We sit on, we sit, we go to the, the release boats. The captains love it. I mean, we, we have a great relationship with the release boat captains and the tournament anglers, I think. And uh, we work with them to prevent these kinds of things. Um, I believe in that. I believe mm -hmm. in, in keeping things as free as possible for these folks, but working together to prevent these issues. I don't know if we're going to have that same situation here, um, but uh, but we are going to deal with it. Yeah, and that's just that's just where we're at in 2023 with a camera. And I remember yep. like when you know I'm I was really because I lived next to Shenandoah when the fish kill happened. It was guides that actually brought it to the attention of of, the, of everyone first because they're on the river and they documented it. And that's where I think it's important is don't just gossip. You think there's an issue, take a picture and just be like, is this thing okay? And it doesn't, guys. This hasn't to do with just industrial fishing. If you think there's a spill, yeah, like having a middle river, you think there's something wrong, just snap a picture and document what happened. The waypoint. I had people telling me they didn't want to tell me where in the chick 
because they didn't want to give away their GPS points, waypoints and stuff. It's like, come on. If you think there's a specific issue, the only way there can be any kind of remedy is you document what you saw. Yep. So if it was a big like, oh, this was ground zero for something really major, you have a point of reference. Well, you look, I, I, I got that information and we had no problem finding out. We had the whole number. Mm -hmm. We had no problem finding out. So, um, and I do document this, you mm -hmm. know, I, I keep a, f a file on my computer um, and share it. You know, we have to talk about these things. It's nothing to, for people. We can fix some of these things, right? And no things happen and yeah. um, problems happen, mistakes happen. Sometimes you, sometimes you lose all five of your fish in your live well and it's heartbreaking. Talk to those people. They're not happy about it. They yeah. don't, they want to keep those fish alive. I get it. Sometimes mistakes happen, right? It's a matter of repeating those mistakes, whether or not we can prevent that from happening. And um, that's what I'm working toward, preventing these mistakes. We're not blaming. Mm -hmm. um, recognize that problems happen, but we've got to work to prevent the uh, from, from them happening again because there are bad optics. And we have businesses built. I was talking to people. They don't want to bring their clients out to see dead fish floating on the water. Yep. It's bad. Look for the fishery. Mm -hmm. And look, we're already dealing with situations where people are scared of the water, scared of water quality, scared to touch the water, scared to go swimming in the water, right? Now they're seeing dead fish on the water. And I tell you what, they don't know why those dead fish are on the water. They're just boating around. They're kayaking around. They see a bunch of dead fish on the water. So what do they assume? Yep. They assume this is the worst river in history. Mm -hmm. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. You know, I live right outside D.C. I don't want people to think that the Potomac River is the worst fishery in the history. Right. Not only do I live here and have a stake in what people mm -hmm. think about the area, I also manage the fishery. <laughs> That's one of the most popular fisheries yeah. for the Potomac River. So, you know, we've got to just do better. And uh, we're getting there. I think. I think we really yeah. people people always forget history. I remember when I had when I had Marty on talking about it. Like, yeah, back in like the '80s, the water quality issue. People don't like people at Heinz. Like, oh, the water quality is not good now. It's like, yeah, but if you go back 20, 30 years, it's a hell of a lot yes. better. It's yep. insane. And yep. he, and we talked about how like I think it was like the the Hudson River. It's like the color of the water depended on whatever they were painting their trucks up river. Yeah. We've come a long way, people. Yes. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's just have some appreciation for how well we've, we've, we've gone with this. Yeah. I haven't seen a, f a river on fire in a while. <laughs> yeah. Like right. That, I mean, we, but that was real. That was had, real. Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely. And actually I was just um, reading that the Anacostia opened up to swimming for, I think the first time in 50 years. That's insane. But it's it, the Anacostia. <laughs> I know, but it should, you know, it's 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 still it you know you got to be careful about the fish you eat out of there but it should show that progress can be made when we all work together and yeah we have the clean water act and stuff but we all have a responsibility to reduce pollution maintain you know good yards that kind of stuff and um, we can all work together to to do these things, right? To to help water quality. I know that people pointed to Blue Plains as a, actually a, a, a reason for why the river was clean, got got cleaner, right? Because mm -hmm. of better infrastructure for improving yes. nutrient um, expulsion. Um, and it's true, and that's great. I mean, and that's great. That's that's Blue Plains. But let's not minimize the value we all have in you know making sure that our waterways are you know well kept and that our fisheries are well kept because yeah i mean yeah that that old adage you know you're not just protecting the fishery for you you're protecting it for your kids for the next generation um it's true it's absolutely true and we have a lot of a lot of issues that we're worrying about with climate change and and invasive species and yeah. such and they're not going away they're only becoming worse mm -hmm. so um you know we have and it's sad, it's sad to say this, but with all these other issues coming, right, we have a greater responsibility to protect these fisheries. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. When, and, um, you know, I think, I think we've been doing it. Look at what's happened with bass fishery and yeah. catch and release fishing mm -hmm. in the past 50 years, right? We've gone from a pract from a commercial fishery for, for black bass in this state to essentially 99% catch and release, right? huge improvement so you can complain about a few dead fish floating around your dock right get it but go back in time 50 years yeah, the river's not on fire <laughs> like, yeah. the river's not on fire yeah right we've made some improvements here and uh you're right we have to appreciate those things 
I think it's good to keep an eye on the future, to know that things can be better if we work toward that um, together. And that's why we do what we do here, right? Because we believe that things can be better. Um, and, you know, that's that's why we do what we do. That's why I do what I do. Joe, thank you so much for, for donating so much of your time today to, to be able to come on this program. And again, guys, link into everything that we talked about in the episode description. Um, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.